Should we just be following our hearts? That's what we're going to talk about today. If a man would make his world large, he must always be making himself small. G.K. Chesterton. Today we're going to talk about a book that I thought was kind of interesting by Thaddeus J. Williams called Don't Follow Your Heart, Boldly Breaking the Ten Commandments of Self-Worship. Kind of an interesting situation because I know I believe that we are each created with talents and skills given by God, that we should be finding ways to use those talents and skills to serve God. This whole idea that we're all special snowflakes, that we should follow our heart, it's not true. We should be following God, the things he's asked us to do, and using our gifts and talents to do it. And in the course of that, we will become fulfilled in our lives and gain the kind of life we're hoping to have. I know it's kind of interesting coming from someone who has kind of a self-help slash productivity podcast, and that's why I wanted to do this podcast too. I believe we can improve our lives. We can be more effective with the gifts that God gave us, we can do actions better if we get more organized, if we get our vision, goals written down, those kinds of things. But that's not where it ends, right? It's a means to an end. And in our modern world, we look at ourselves and self-help and productivity as the end, right? And I'm just saying, this is a path towards getting to the ultimate goal of serving God. As compared to, like I said, the Western world, which is saying we should follow our heart. (laughs) This book is filled with a ton of pop culture references, music and everything else, where it's saying we should follow our hearts. We can think of a lot of songs and a lot of ways that our culture tells us to do this, where everyone tells us to do this, that we should be you, boo-boo, and we should be our own special snowflakes, and that we have these philosophers that are telling us that the best way forward is to worship ourselves, to give up on God. And you have to believe that it's kind of the next evolution, right? Let me just say that this way. The devil takes a lot of strategies to try to remove us from God. He doesn't care that you worship him. That's not the point of this. The point is you don't worship God. And it is done by self-worship. It is done by the culture saying, hey, your happiness is all that matters. You know what? You should live with your boyfriend because that's that's what brings you joy. That's what brings you happiness. That's the only thing that matters. Or to the extent of atheism, there is no God. There never was a God. And in fact, all these rules and all these things that you're reading about, you're just being silly and you're, you're ruining your own life just in the name of worshiping a God. The self always becomes the God. And in fact, isn't that the very first sin, the Adam and Eve, that, hey, don't listen to God. You're not going to die. And if you do this thing, you know what? You're going to be able to challenge God. Being, putting yourself in the position of God is the very first sin. And in fact, it is the source of everything. That's why pride is such a horrible sin, because you're saying to God, you know what? I know better. You say you created the world and you know the entire universe and you know everything there is, but you know what? I'm just a little bit smarter than you are. So this whole self-worship, everything just assures us that our heart is the center of everything, that we are the source of all truth, that we get our best lives when we follow our heart and we follow what it is we're trying to do. And I think that sometimes people find it unimaginable to live the Christian life because how am I going to be happy if I do those things? I won't be able to live with my boyfriend. I won't be able to do everything I want to do. I'm going to have to do all these other things. And so in a sense, that's what it is. So he gives what he says is the 10 commandments of the worship of self. And they're all hashtags. Hashtag live your best life. Hashtag okay boomer, which means everything outdated is no good and everything new is fantastic. Hashtag follow your heart. Boy, obey your emotions. Listen to your heart. Now I got the rock set song in my head. Hashtag be true to yourself. That's all that matters. Hashtag you do you. 
you live your truth. I'll live my truth. We pretend, oh, I'll leave you alone because we're each living our own truth. But in fact, we don't leave each other alone. We then go and persecute those other people who live a different truth than we do. Hashtag YOLO. You only live once. Really? You only live once? Boy, that is a real denial of God. But we have to do everything right now because it's the only chance we're going to have. And hashtag the answers lie within. Again, I don't have to think about being a sinner or looking for God to judge my life or tell me what to do. All my answers are right here in my little heart. Hashtag be authentic, meaning true to your own identity. Hashtag live the dream. That means I'm going to go out and I'm going to do everything I want to do, regardless of what God has to say about it, regardless of what hurt it may cause other people. And then the last one, hashtag love is love. That everything, as long as we call it love, forgetting that we love because God loved us first. He is the author of love. And so he's going to understand it no better than anyone. He challenged Peter with agape versus filio love. And so he says, those are the Ten Commandments. But he reminds us that we worship ourselves and that's what we do. We put ourselves in the position of God. We know best. But you know what? In the end, we are not God. And if we deify ourselves, we're going to be unhappy. You know, we think by doing these things, we're going to be the happiest we've ever been. We're going to live this fantastic life. And I think we find out it's pretty shallow. It's pretty meaningless. It doesn't lead to true happiness. Instead, we find out that following ourselves and following our hearts and all these things doesn't lead to much good at all. He gives the Psalm 115, 5 through 8. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. Hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. They make no sound in their throat. But those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Meaning idols. Whenever we're worshiping an idol, which is just everything that is not God, anything that we, in a sense, pray to, to make this world better, to make this life better, whether it's government, our heart, trust in other people, our trust in this earth, we have made an idol of something. And every time God and even the people who worshiped other gods, like the cults that the Jewish people came across when they were in the land of Canaan, that were worshiping and sacrificing children to their God. It's in their own image. In the end, there are no other gods, and they're worshiping something they wanted to do. They wanted to say, I can have unlimited sex and it's fine. So they made a religion that made that. They wanted to be able to sacrifice children. They wanted to build the Tower of Babel, so they you know, call it in the name of religion. He ties it back to a lot of philosophers who basically say, we either make God in our own image or God makes us in our image and then we return the compliment. That's Voltaire. But the point of it is, there is a God. He reigns on high. He made us. He loves us. He wants the best for us. He cares for us. He wants us to walk in a way that will give us true fulfillment and walk in a way that serves the other people on earth. He understands it all. He is the author of life. He knows how all of this is supposed to go. He said that when we walk away from God, we forget that, first of all, God never breaks his promises or lies to us. We do that. God is not bound by time and even space, I would say. Instead, he sees everything with perfect clarity. He understands how everything goes. We think we're going to create this amazing nuclear power. And then God says, yeah, well, you know what's going to happen to? You're also going to create the A-bomb. Not saying that we shouldn't have that power, but just saying he sees clearly what's going to happen. He says that God is self-existent. Is that it's not that he is the most sovereign. It's not that he is the most on high God. He is a thing all unto itself. There is nothing that can become higher, nothing that can defeat him, nothing can go beyond him. He is this entity that is of himself, self-existing, doesn't need anything to be created, doesn't need anything to keep creating. We depend on things. He does not. 
got a sovereign and enthroned over the whole universe. And what's funny is it's the whole universe, the, the one who makes all the planets and the particles and the minerals and everything. He's sovereign over everything. Man, I can't even control pets I have. I have a pet bird. He's obstinate as all get out. He can't control our lives, yet he is the creator of everything. He's not ta- bound by space. Let's see, there was that one. So he's everywhere and can be everywhere at every given moment. He says that he's infinitely satisfying, that he can bring us the ultimate satisfaction in life instead of all this, I don't know, thing that we think we want to worship that brings us nothing. And it says at the very end, God can create in the sheer act of willpower. He can will things into existence and we can only create It's pretty amazing that we can create. And the reason we can create is because God made us in his image, but we can only create from things that are actually there. He goes on, I don't want to read the whole book to you, but essentially you get the idea that God is infinite and amazing and awesome, transcendent, perfect, all these things. And we try to do the best we can, but yet somehow in all our flaws, and we know when we've hurt people, We know we've done things to other people that we shouldn't have done. We still think we're the ones who should be God, even though we know how flawed we are. But you get the general idea. God is amazing. God is stunning. God loves us, cares for us, wants to protect us, wants us to come to him. And, you know, we have moments of inspiration, but most of the time we're not able to do anything like that. He talks about how, the second one, which is basically going against everything old. Oh, you know, I thought, and I've seen people say this, I thought we'd be done with this whole religion thing like ages ago. I can't believe we're still doing this. We're modern people and modern people don't follow God, Hmm? don't they? We are improving in some ways, but for the most part, we're more capable of destroying ourselves. And so just because you think faith is old, and you reject it because you're a modern person, doesn't mean you're right. He talks a lot about following the heart in general, being fun and being attractive is a very high principle. Being loved and valued by other people, important. And that I feel at peace, that I'm rested, that I get to do fun things, right? And instead, they end up feeling anxiety, dread, lonesomeness. We have heard Other countries give high-level government positions to figure out why people are so lonely nowadays. Instead, God wants us to be adopted children, to be cared for. He said when in the Gospels that he wants to bring us together like hens take their chicks under their wings. Isn't that cozy? That's the thing that he wants and came and did everything for us through his death and resurrection. He put it out there all on the line for us. That's the kind of things he wants. And he wants us to be heirs. He wants us to live in the mansions of heaven. And I think that we have this bad idea of it's like heart playing angels and fat and chubby and stuff like that. Angel look kind of thing. But instead, we're going to be creative. We're going to create things. We're going to make things that are amazing. We're just not going to have these sins, these pettinesses, this hate that goes on between us, that's just not going to exist anymore. He says that when we feel like we have to true, be true to ourselves, a lot of people in history think that's true. It's funny how people think that being a selfish chemical meat bag is a modern thought. Boy, it's been since the beginning of time. It's even part of every philosophy book out there. Aleister Crowley said, do what you want. Jean-Paul Sartre said that We live in a godless world and we should just do the very things we want to do. And Timothy Leary, who did the whole turn on, tune in, drop out, let himself into what they call the age of Aquarius, this drug consuming life. You know, and it's funny how many of these people who do what they think makes them free, what gives them freedom, the drugs, the alcohol, the, the sex and everything else like that leads to their destruction. They think they know what's right. They even think they know what's right for them. And in truth, they ended up not living a life that was true, lived a life that was destructive. They couldn't even figure out their own lives. How were they telling other people to live? And instead, God is saying, 
I will do everything for you. And I bore the cross for you. And I want you to have fulfilled lives where you're living out your telios, you're, you're meeting your purpose and serving other people and bringing them back home to God so that they too can live the satisfied, fulfilled life that Christ offers. Everything that's beautiful, everything that is truth and justice, that's what God is trying to bring us back. So the book continues on and just talks about relativism. You know, relativism's hard. Like, you do do, you boo-boo. You know, there's no rules out there. There's no ultimate truth. But we've learned that there is, of course, ultimate truth. We hit up against it and we say, wow, that that is wrong. There's many instances we can look in history and say, yes, that is wrong. That is something that is absolutely wrong. Well, how do we know? How do we know that's wrong? It's because we know the truth of God in there somewhere tells us it's wrong. But when we live in a world that has no wrong, it's just all self-worship. He brings up one of my favorite scenes in Lord of the Rings. And obviously, J.R. Tolkien was a Christian, a Catholic. And he wrote this passage. Frodo asked Sam, he says, what are we holding on to, Sam? Like, why do we keep fighting this stupid ring and Sauron? What are we trying to do here? Because Frodo's at the end of his rope. And Sam says that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Boy, I love that whole speech of Sam. But he said in the modern age, Sam would just say, well, there's no good in the world. There's no, uh, you know, truth. Sauron has his mission. We all have our missions. We're all doing the best we can. It's all relative. You do you, boo-boo, Sauron. No, that doesn't work at all. Thanos, he just has his own truth. He was just trying to save the environment by removing half of anyone who ever existed. That's all. It doesn't work. In moral relativity, it works because we have a plumb line. We have a straight line of God telling us the rights and the wrongs. And when we go down this path that there are no rights and wrongs, there's just opinion. Or even worse, you know, I've seen too. Like we're just um, electrical and chemical meat bags. We're just following our intuition. So everything's okay, right? We could go throughout the whole history of what Genghis Khan did. Perfectly fine. Because he was just following his own truth. You know, if there's no right and wrong and there's no ultimate moral stance, then basically we all can just decide what is right and wrong. And we can't really blame someone when they do something horrible with that. We let emotion and the way we filter out the truth lead us. We're just going to go down this bad path. And he says um, there's something called cognitive based training, you know, which is essentially to teach yourself the proper way to react or to do things. He says the ultimate is Psalm 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates night and day. He is like a tree planted by the stream of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does prospers. And the wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that in the wind drives away. That's the wheat is the grain, is the fruit, is the production of a wheat, right? The chaff is just what remains on the ground. It, we, it blows away. It's not even worthwhile. He's saying that that Psalm 1 is what we should focus on when we're trying to talk ourselves out of this self-love, this relativism. This, we have the truth in our heart. Instead, we have to trust the God at the center of everything we have. We, we use it in our life with our family, in our romantic life, our emotional life, our political life, our intellectual life, our life with our friends and our finances, and how we react in our job. When God in the Holy Spirit is the center that holds us all together, That's where we're going to have all those things fall into line. I see people who just, like I said, live their lives. They don't want God to be a part of it. They live with their boyfriend until they're ready to not live with their boyfriend. So their family life is entirely me-guided. Their jobs, they may cheat. They may not follow any sort of a moral standing inside their jobs. As long as they're getting ahead, that's all that matters. When they look at politics, they look at what is the politics that 
fits with my viewpoint, not in what would fit with what God wants in this world. I think about that all the time. My friend kind of made his comment once a long time ago that said, religion is sort of a shortcut so you don't have to think anymore, so that you could just say, well, this is how I'm supposed to live my life. And I said, that has not been my experience. My experience has been that religion makes you have to think more because now I just don't think about what I want. I think about what God wants. And I hold his line of what is right and wrong to everything. He gives some comparisons to Pinocchio, who is self-defining, like what it means to be a boy, or the Little Mermaid, about how she wants to live her dream and be outside the sea, making her own life. That every message we're getting from this culture is telling us the wrong thing, is telling us that nothing is more important than me, that nothing is more important than my happiness, that my life is not about meaning and purpose and God-given abilities and talents and using those, but instead it's whatever makes me happy, whatever it is I want to do. But he says that, you know what? The celebrities of the Bible are saying, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so you will love him and live. That Jesus says, may the love with which you loved me be in them. Jesus talking to God the Father. For you loved me, Father, before the world's foundation. Or Paul saying, may God cause you to increase and abound in love. John, dear brothers, let us love one another because love comes from God. So essentially, instead of focusing in ourselves, We're going to focus in on everybody else and we're going to focus on God and love, not love of the self, but love of God and his creation. And because God loved us first, we can love other people. So he gives in the very end these new Ten Commandments that are how we're going to change our self-focused lives. And we're going to listen to St. Paul and St. Peter, St. Mark, instead of St. Disney and all the other things that we hear. Because all these things that we have in life is self-destructive, robs us of awe, joy, love, makes us feel shallow in the end, strips us of credibility, makes us arrogant, impossibly dull, he says, creates all the problems we're going to have in life. Like I said, my father felt free from religion because he was a smart man who knew better than all those weirdos who believed in religion. And he was a slave to his own ill passions, the drinking, and uh, among uh, many other things. He was not free at all, but instead enslaved to his own life. So he said in the end, if we have awe for the Bible, if we reject the devil and all his works, if we follow God's heart instead of our own heart or before our own heart, if we rebel against self-worship, if we have the courage to champion the good, true things that God presents to us instead of these ugly, evil, falsehood age, if we try to seek God's kingdom, which is full of adventures and challenges instead of just wandering around on the flatlands, he says, with our own subjectivity, we look to God's word instead of looking within. If we're authentic before the fact that God is God and we're not, And if we express our God-given freedom within God's form and morality, and when we love others redemptively with an eye towards the eternal good, that which is God, when we go those directions, that's when we're going to have the fulfilled life. That's when we're going to have not self-worship, but joy inside the worship of God. You know, I've been doing now the Bible in small steps. I didn't know what effect it would have on me. You know, I I thought, we're going to read through the Bible. We're going to learn a lot. You know, in my mind, this is going to be a learning experience. I have this peace inside of me now. I, I didn't expect all of this. I am so filled with peace. And now when you see things happening in the world and you're like, well, okay. You know, God says it's going to be tough, but I know what to do. I know how to follow God, and I know what actions to take next. So my challenge to you is to take a good introspective look. I said, don't look to yourself for everything. 
But how much of your life is self-worship? How much of your life is you being you, boo-boo? How much of your own life is listening to your own dreams, your own will, your own everything? And how much of it is looking towards God and trying to find that peace that suppresses all understanding because God is going to keep our hearts and minds, right? God is going to show us love, not for just for him, but for each other. I'm going to do a really good analysis of how much of the things you're doing are looking too much at the self. I know, I know my things. You know, I had a very chaotic childhood. My life was just a mess, right? I spent my entire, I guess, 20s piecing my life together, getting the things I wanted in my life. I wanted to have a house. I have a house. I wanted to get a dog. I got a dog. I want to be able to retire at a time. I've been working on my retirement. But how much of the peace I have in my life is because I have designated what I decided is going to give me peace instead of looking at God who is going to give me the real peace. All of this could go away tomorrow. The real peace is going to come from Jesus and living the life he has asked us to live. Everyone, thanks so much. This is a deep message, right? I appreciate you listening. If you have anything to say to me, please go ahead and email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this particular thing. And I hope it helped in comparison the God-centered life versus the self-centered life. And remember, our walk towards serving the God who breathed life into everything starts with small steps, small, humble steps. <laughs>